Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Terrace Marie is a screenwriter and actress whose first novel is Creating Waves. And as one of her reader calls it, a riveting page turner. Black Pearl is a female crime thriller that centers on the shattered dreams of an actress who entangles herself into a criminal underworld. Like her character, Marie has seen her own series of challenges, namely Stargard's disease. Despite losing her vision, career, and hope, her ancestors summoned her to rise up on Juneteenth, 2020, when she began to write. The self-healing process of storytelling gave her the courage she needed to pursue acting and rewrite her story. Please welcome mm. Teresa Marie. That was beautiful. Thank you. So when you. were you first diagnosed with this Stargardt's disease and what are the symptoms you experience with it? Well, the first time I was officially diagnosed, my son was about one years old. So that was 10 years old. So I was born with a disease, but I was officially diagnosed at that time. I started noticing some changes in my vision. And so the doctors I was going to at that time, I didn't realize there were like different types of eye doctors, if that makes sense. So they were saying, oh, you have a really bad astigmatism or, you know, I remember one optometrist had told me, I can't wave a magic wand and make you be able to see, right? I knew things were happening and things I used to could see was like starting to disappear, like McFly from Back to the Future. You know how mm -hmm. like in the end when he's looking at that picture and then it's like the future is changing and then the image on the photograph is starting to like fade away like certain parts that's what was happening to my to my vision it was like certain things I used to could see I couldn't see I just so happened to be talking to a coworker, and then she told me about a retina specialist that her daughter was seeing and so I went to go see him and then that's when I was officially diagnosed the best way to describe the symptoms is that for me it was just a slow chip away so yeah. it was like wait, what's happening? And I guess it started with things getting a little more distorted because what the disease does is it actually, whatever you're looking directly at, your central vision is affected. So that's why when you look at things, I would find myself kind of like trying to search for the image, like using parts of my peripheral to be able to see clearly an image that I knew or a vantage point that I knew that I used to be able to see easily. So it was like, it's a slow, a slow chip away. So it's like the macular de degeneration where, how, how I used to describe it when I worked for Canadian National Institute for the Blind is like, you have this film in front of your eyeball and you have to keep looking around it, right? So, Absolutely. yeah, so I, I would that's imagine, so that Stargardt's disease is a form of, Macular it absolutely is. Yeah. Yes. And they actually call it the juvenile form because most of the patients are children or the onset yeah. usually happens in children. So by the time they're in their twenties, they're usually legally blind. But for me, I had it, it's already a rare disease, but my case was even more rare because the onset happened in my adulthood. So there usually isn't any cure for these things and correct correct so correct. that realization that this is happening and it's not going to get better and your life is changing how did I mean I don't even know how to ask the question how right. do you deal with that even mentally well to be honest and I'm gonna just be totally blunt 
because I didn't really, really understand what was happening to me when the doctor sat down with me and told me about it. It was kind of weird because you know how when you know something's bad news because I was in, well, I don't want to say bad news, but you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not what you expect because I was sitting there and then first it was him and then like some other guys came and then there were like four people and they were like all looking at, you know, this film or whatever. So then I turned around, I'm like, what y'all looking at? What's going on? So <laughs> then they were like looking at giving me this weird look. After that, he explained to me that I did have this disease, Stargardt, and he handed me a brochure. Then he handed me a like Sherlock Holmes magnifying glass at that time. Right. He said, it's probably a good idea for you to learn Braille. Um, and mm -hmm. so I was like, pause. <laughs> like, <laughs> so hold on. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it literally happened that way. It was like, he talked, so he sat down. And so it was I was literally like, just like throwing all this stuff at you at once. So in, in my childhood, really quickly, I, I, I grew up with not much. So it was always important to me, like when I became an adult, I was going to have the job and make this money. And I was like going to make six figures by the time I was 30, you know, so I had this like vision in my head. And I don't want to say that money could buy everything because I never believed that, but I wanted to be in a position uh, financially to where if anything was to happen that I could afford to be able to get it fixed or get it, or I could do whatever I wanted to do, travel and do all of these things as long as I had the job and then the money, right? So I was like, well, hold on, how much does it cost for me to like get the surgery to get it done? So that's like my brain goes there first. Yeah. Even though I kind of heard them say that there's no cure, I'm like, well, I, I got money, what you need, how much is it, you know? <laughs> and so he was like, no, it doesn't work like that. So then I was like, well, okay, what list can you put me on to give me some new eyeballs? This is how I'm thinking, yeah. you know? And so I was like, can you put me on some kind of list and give me some eyes? And so he was like, well, the disease you have. So then he started explaining is genetic and you were born with it. And he started telling me about how no matter what eyes you have, because it's part of like, I guess, a miscode in your genetic mm -hmm. DNA. And, and that's what's attacking your central vision is going to continue to do that. So then I was like, oh, no. Uh -oh. So am I going to go all the way blind? What does this mean? So he's like, well, it's your central vision. So you won't go all the way blind, but nine times out of 10, you're going to go legally blind. So as I said, here's a magnifying glass, here's, you know, and so, and, and then you, you should probably right now learn Braille. So I just started <laughs> bawling. And then he didn't know what to do with me. It didn't sound like he had very good bedside manner to begin with. I didn't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a good experience, but then I'm kind of extra sometimes. It's just might've been my personality, but anyway. I just started bawling. He ended up giving me this 1-800 number. And that was my first like experience when it came to that. But mm -hmm. from that point on, everything is negotiable or there's always, to me, a no is not no. Yeah. In some cases is yeah. what I'm saying. Of course, no means no in, in, in extreme cases. But that's when I started doing more research. And then I was able to find a amazing doctor, Dr. Richard Lewis, who was one of the founders, because this disease is relatively new, right? or not new, but you know, just newly researched. And so I was able to get with him with Baylor College of Medicine. And so then he put me in contact with a low vision specialist, who has given me, you know, technology, this is my Ruby, and she magnifies things and, you know, show me apps with my phone. And so that's where I started climbing back up as far as being able to understand that I can still have my independence mm -hmm. and that, you know, the more educate, more educated I became, the, the, um, better I had become with, you know, the, the actual diagnosis that, um, the diagnosis I had received. Absolutely. You can't even put a price tag on how re valuable those resources are, especially when you're in such a a position and you don't know where to go. The technology that has evolved has been fantastic. Thank you for throwing in a bit of your backstory there. And How did you talk about finding your way into the corporate world and then the adjustment when this started happening? Okay. So as a child, 
I was always like adventurous. I didn't grow up with much, but I meant I grew up with love. My grandparents raised me. And so I did grow up in a loving home where they exposed me to the arts, but I didn't have a lot of material things, you know? So I had to use my imagination a lot. And I used to do a lot of drawing and, you know, in hindsight, there's always been this artsy part of me that as a child, I would explore. But as I began to get older, I was like, okay, this isn't going to pay the bills, you know? But it was a side of me that I knew that I always wanted to kind of keep there because it made me feel whole, if that makes sense. When I went to college, I went to Florida A&M University, which is in Tallahassee, Florida, and I had received a journalism scholarship. Now, someone else had asked me, like, well, how did that happen? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't exactly remember how that happened, but I think it was like God trying to put me on the path. But in my head, I was like, you know, I wasn't going to make enough money to survive. And so I ended up going to this Tell symposium. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a symposium and they actually had freshmen sit down and then they showed like this chart where they had, you graduate, you know, school of journalism. This is how much you were going to make. And I want to say the average salary was $15,000 at that time. And then they had business <laughs> leaders were making like 50000 <laughs> It was like, this is average. And then the average business major is like 50,000. So I was like, well, what am I doing here? So I left that school and made a major change and then majored in business because at that time I was like, I can't afford, because like I told you, I grew up with my grandparents. They didn't have money. And so I needed to make sure that I was going to have enough money to be able to afford to do these things. So that's what got me into the corporate world. But I always loved fashion. And so I, you know, found my passion in buying. So I went through the buying and merchandising and I did a lot of things for 15 years in that field. So that's kind of where my corporate background is in, in the uh, Macy's of the world and some of these big box retailers. So I learned a lot and I just enjoyed my job and what I was doing. Now in the process of that, as I told you, years progressed. And then towards the end, I ended up getting um, diagnosed with star guards. And then I remember my m amazing doctor, he did say, you know, cause I was like, well, what's the likelihood that I'm just going to wake up and not be able to see and, you know, see my phone. And so he was like, oh, that's very slim. Cause it is a chip away. Right. Like yeah. we talked about. Well, I got so obsessed to be honest that with what I couldn't see, I just started just honing in on what I just no longer could see, you right. know? And I was like, I cannot see. I used to could see this. Now I can't see that. And I was used to constantly tell my husband. And I used to wake up every morning just paranoid. I'm not going to be able to read my phone. Even though he told me that it wasn't going to happen. Or he didn't say it wasn't going to happen. He's like, it was not as likely to happen. Well, for me, it did happen. So <laughs> literally, I woke up. No lie. I thought I was dreaming because I looked at my phone and I can't read my text messages. So I hit. To my husband, am I dreaming? I can't read my phone. And so then I call my do Dr. Lewis and I'm like, you told me this wouldn't happen. He said, I always said it was less likely it would happen. I, never, I was like, oh my God. So anyway, I went into frantic panic mode because now I went from being able to see with correction to putting my contacts on and still not being able to see and read what was in front of me. Hmm. And so I had to take time off from work where I went to an occupational therapist and I saw the low vision retina specialist. She's an ophthalmologist. I learned how to use these devices that we talked about. I learned how to use bioptic telescopes that help you. Even when you're legally blind, you can um, drive with restrictions, okay? In certain states, I don't know if they have that in Canada, but they're my bioptic telescope lenses. And you have to, of course, take classes and then you have to then go to the DMV and then somebody rides with you to make sure that with these telescope, you know, lenses that right. you could be able to drive safely with restrictions. Mm -hmm. I can't drive at night. I can only drive a certain amount of miles, you know, yeah. but yeah. So I did that and I went back to work and I was ready to rock and roll. That's when things I would say went downhill. Oh yeah. Yeah, I can imagine you're in the fashion industry and you can't see that would be, I mean, regardless of whether you've got the technology that can help you do your job, 
that's all they think about, right? So, yeah. And the job that I had at that time was what's called a, a, a merchandise planner, and I was responsible for numbers. So I was a numbers guru at this point because I had two children and I could no longer travel. So this job did not require travel because my husband had a job that traveled. And so it was still, I was in the fashion, but I was the numbers person behind the scenes. So um, the first time I actually had my big magnifier thing here, I had my little small Ruby here that I showed you that is, that is amazing. I had like this whole table set. And so um, it was my first time back at work and they just threw me right into it, right? Because to them, they're like, she's back. Like, you know, she did yeah. her thing. So I stood there, Debbie, and I'm looking out and no one had a head, right? Because this is the first time I'm back in a corporate environment and I'm getting ready to do my presentation. And I was like, I can't see anybody's head. I was hearing all these voices and it was kind of like Spider-Man, if that makes sense. Yeah. I was smelling people's coffee. <laughs> it was like all of this <laughs> stuff was going on, but I couldn't see. It. And people were talking to me like, you okay? And I was like, no, you know, and I left, I had to leave. And so I called my husband. I was like, nobody has heads. Like I, this is a part that I didn't, wasn't prepared for <laughs> was that mental part to being wow. in this big environment of people and not be able to see, you know, it was all these headless people, but I can hear the familiar voices, but I couldn't see. And so my friend came and sat with me. And anyway, I went back in there and I pulled myself together after I cried and prayed and I rocked it, to be honest with you. I had been doing this for 15 years. So I kind of knew where things were and I did all this prep beforehand. You had a show, which was amazing about invisible and visible disabilities, disabilities yeah. and um, yes, visual and visible and invisible, invisible yeah. disabilities. It was a beautiful story that Thank you me. did because what people don't realize sometimes is that if you don't have, you know, I would say a wheelchair or something that's obvious, I'm yeah. still disabled, right? But to someone else, they may be like, oh, she's good, you know, yeah, she's all right. But it's like, no, I really can't see what's in front of me. It's like, I do have all these things that are going on. And in the corporate environment, it was difficult because then I noticed that I had now restrictions on hours yeah. because of the daytime and nighttime hours. And so I couldn't work as many hours. This was before COVID where there was a lot of work from home. And then because it's an invisible disability, people couldn't really relate to... they think you're making it up thank you oh. I get that I get it when you're got an invisible disability it's like they think you're making it up totally so I can't yeah. even imagine yeah. it's so frustrating and... isn't it especially if you can't see it was freaking me out you know but nobody really understood. And then the fear that I had, even so driving, you know, even though I had these bioptics and things like that, I would work from home because even though I had these like limited hours in the office, then I would come home. But the culture wasn't built yet to where work from home was res as respected as it is now. And yeah. what it boiled down to was just that, hey, um, we know that you're here 32 hours. I need you back to your 50 or 60 hours. And when I would start presenting my numbers and then they would say, you know, when I would have five years of history. And so then they would say, okay. And I would say, okay, well, I'm projected to do this. And they were like, well, how much did you do in, you know, 2018 week four for that sale that we had? And I'm like trying to blow it up, magnify it, move. And they're like, oh, and then they would just get upset because I was taking longer than I used to and I could fit yeah. it and find it really quickly. And so that is where I had to step away from, from, my, from the corporate environment. And then I lost myself. Mm. When did you find out that you weren't alone in this? Mm, that is a really good question. During this time when I did the occupational therapy and all of that, I actually turned to Facebook and then I saw that they had a Star Guard community, right? And so I saw there were these guys, two blind brothers, to be honest, and 
the two blind brothers, they were retailers and they made these shirts and both of them had Stargard's disease. And so I started following them and then I started seeing that, okay, it, it made me feel better to know, like you were saying that, because you do feel alone because it's rare. No one else in my family has it. I have a very good network, just so you know, Debbie, and my husband and my kids, like I would talk, I talk openly about in my friends and family, what I'm going through, but you still do have that part of you that does still feel alone because no one quite understands exactly what you're going through. But that's when I first started feeling this sense of community it, where I could see that there were people with star guards or low vision that were just doing the thing, you know, still doing their jobs and finding their way with this same eye disease that I had. Hmm. I love that you use Juneteenth to transition into writing. How confident were you in your skills as a writer when you when you began? You are asking the best question. Oh, thank you. That actually was not on purpose that it was Juneteenth. I went through this downhill where it's like, okay, this is something I have been doing for 15 years. I no longer, I lost myself in a sense that it's like, what am I going to do now? And I was trying to figure it out. Am I going to be a stay at home mom? Like, what is it? To be honest with you, killed my confidence in being able to feel like I can really present myself authentically because of, I want to say, you know, the environment that I was in at that time, I, I felt like I wanted to run and hide. And so I was like really trying to figure out, I was like, well, I'm disabled. So let me just live in this disability and just, you know, but stay, being a stay at home mom, is not me. And so anyway, I ended up though hitting rock bottom and that's something that and it's like I noticed myself sleeping more and then I started slowly making a descent to the floor. Depression, yeah. And I found myself on the back on the and I didn't know it though at that time. I, I ended up getting therapy and things, but I, I didn't know I was going into depression. My grandmother, she raised me, she had died. I lost my vision and my job and it's like then COVID hit. And so all these things were happening. And then I ended up on the floor. And then I just started hearing that you are alone and that you've done what you were supposed to do on this earth. And I started hearing these like really horrible things. And I started just questioning like, is that, is it, it? like, did, did I do that? Cause I had done a lot of great things in my career and I had these kids, but I'm still young, but I started struggling, but I was like, it was a really hard time. I was depressed. And then I heard get up. And so then I got up and then I went into the shower. I was a mess when I got up, just so you know, because when you're depressed, you don't clean. So my floor was dirty. My face was dirty. My hair was all balled up. I was a hot mess. And so I got in the shower and I started crying and I was like, God, just tell me what to do. And I will never get on that floor again. And I will make sure that I will help as many people as I can to get off that floor and to never get back on the floor, right? And clear as day, Debbie, I heard, write a book. So that's where that came from. And so I sat down and I got in front of my computer and it's blown up like right now my screen is almost the size of my desk. And so I had started coming and it's funny you said the answer is because it's so real. So I started looking for myself. I was like, well, maybe I need to write about myself or I was trying to figure it out, but I started hearing these characters and some of them were criminals. And so I was like, why are you doing that? But they just started do it, doing all these things. And then I found myself in Africa, to be honest. And the name of this character was Queen Adaku. And I had wrote that down on my screen. It was blown up in big old font. So I was like, now what? Because I have no idea how to write. <laughs> no experience. I'm in the corporate world. I haven't written anything since I was a little girl. Like what? I was like, well, a paragraph is five sentences. So let me just, and so I doubted myself for a second. And then I heard Beyonce, she starts singing Black Parade. And then I was like, it's Juneteenth. And so I was like, you know what? And she was talking about the ancestors. And then I was about to write about this queen in Africa. And I said, okay, God, I'm just going to write. So I just started writing, not worrying about formatting, not worrying about anything, yep. just whatever these stories were, whatever these characters were saying to me, I just started writing it, not caring about anything else. And then 
from there, I was like, I got the story together, you know? And so I sent it to an editor and then the editor said, Luke, did you do editing? It's like, okay, so we don't quite do that. Like you at least had to learn a craft, you know, you need to hire a writing coach. And so I did that. His name was Bruce McAllister, like my savior. And he just taught me and I was learning really quickly. He caught me a quick study. I call him my literary Yoda, actually. <laughs> he was like, wow. And I would just say, okay, well, is this right? Is that right? And he was literally saying, if you want to talk about, I, when I would write a, di a dialogue, I would say, Debbie, quote, tell me about Stargard, Terrace. Like, I didn't know. And so he taught me from that point. Like, it's like, Debbie act, comma, quotation. So he would like give me that little example. And I wrote my first novel correctly, I would say, um, in two months, which right is Black on. Pearl. Two months. Right on. And what has that process of writing taught you about yourself? Was it also writing that first book about being seen? Mm. So the first book, so this was actually my fourth novel I wrote. And the first, but there is a correlation between all my characters, which all have female leads. And in every story, they're trying to find out who they are. Now, I write women's crime. <laughs> so, but the crime is, I would say, a representation of what can happen when someone goes dark to survive. The mask is a representation also because almost every one of my characters in some form or another, they are masking something. And that comes from within, you know, for me, because that's how I was at one point. It taught me that one, I needed to be in this space. I made a commitment that I was going to be authentic. And I also made a commitment that I was not going to work for the dollar, right? And that I made a promise to God that I was going to help as many people as I could to get up and to stay up. And that is my mission. And so whether you read Black Pearl or whether you roll with Black Pearl or not, it's more important for me that I touch someone that could hear this story and to know that you know, I'm just getting started. I'm over 40 and that it's never too late. It is never too late. And that you have to get up. First of all, if you're down, get up because there's nothing good that's down there on that floor. Get up. And there is going to be after that storm. We talked about this earlier. Uh, we talked about volcanoes and growth. But after every storm, there's always growth after that, after the clearance. And so that is my mission through writing is to inspire people to be the best version of themselves and to know that no matter what the flaws are, no one is perfect and that you still have so much to do on this earth. Wow. So <clears throat> talk about the unrepresented genres in literature and media and how this was also part of the genesis of your book. Yes. Okay. So in searching for the genres, I don't want to say it was by accident, but I guess I can say it wasn't on purpose, right? I didn't really even know at that time what genres and I had to study the craft, which I did. I ended up reading and learning and understanding. I was just writing at the time when I first started. So I was just writing, particularly the Black Pearl is the story I ended up using as my first novel because it's the fourth one I wrote, but the first one I chose to come out and to get thankfully published. I got a literary agent and my publisher, Black Odyssey Media. But this was a story during a time that I grew up in. And so I didn't have to do any research because I ended up realizing too that in fiction, you still have to, when I'm talking about going back to Africa, or I'm talking about going back to certain time periods, you still need to do research to make sure that some of the 
things that were happening during that time is rooted. Some of it is in truth, although you're using your imagination, right? But this was a time period that I grew up in and that I felt comfortable in. And so I was able to take this store, this time period and use it because I knew it. I grew up in it. It happened this way organically, I would say. I, the characters I wrote about, I, I talk about how Pearl represents different the soul of Pearl, I would say, different women in my life. And by that, I just, like, she went dark, but she did that for how, what she felt in the name of love. And that's something I felt all women could relate to. And then the crime aspect, as you talked about, is also underrepresented. I didn't think of it at that time as, you know what I mean? It was just that, like I said, it just so happened and it's probably because of the type of movies I like to watch or maybe the type of things I like to read that I just gravitated more towards that type of writing style. So it was more organic when it came to the genre that, that I picked to write in. And I wanted it to be authentic, right? I wanted it to come from a place that was from my soul and I didn't want it like I, I didn't want to write a, a romance, just a perfect romance for me. I don't watch those like lifetime movies. I didn't really understand what I was doing as far as writing. It just, that's not what came out of me. You know, I wanted care. I, these characters have flaws and they're imperfect. And it was probably because, or not probably, it was because of what I was going through at that time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the women from my life, from my life, excuse me, that have imperfections. And so that is the pathway that I chose in order to write. And then as that was happening, I started studying, learned the craft. And I took Dan Brown. He had a master class and he's a master at writing crime thrillers and such. And so when I started listening to his class, I was like, oh, that's kind of like what I was already doing. So I was able to take some of the, he talked about the, the pace and that, and then that's when I started developing the genre and getting more into the actual specifics to make sure that I'm given authenticity to, to the craft. And a lot of this kind of, besides empowering yourself, how much of this has been, have you noticed it been great modeling for your kids too? Mm. Well, to be honest with you, I learned so much from my kids, right? My daughter knows this story. She's eight. She's the one I would say that that brought me out the closet. And I hope I don't get choked up. But um, when I was like struggling with my vision and trying to figure it out, and mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was supposed to hide it. And so I taught her how to read with my magnifier, which she called the light, right? Because it has a light on the back. And so I took her to a party. And there were all these moms and they were reading to their daughters. And so she was sitting on my lap and one of the moms was reading and there was another mom reading. And so then my daughter, she just reached over and grabbed a book and they was like, oh, you want to, you want to read, a, you want to read that. And so then my daughter hands it to me. And so then I look at it and I couldn't read the font. Right. right? So I was like, all these people are here. They don't know, you know, my kids know, but they don't know. Right. And so I was sitting there. And so I started faking it. I was like, yeah, and then here's an elephant. And then here's a... So my daughter looked at me. She was probably about three or whatever. She reached over me, grabbed my magnifier and put it in my hand and said, light. And so that's when I realized that I have to show her that it is okay, right? That mommy's reading with this. Like it didn't matter to her. She just wanted me to read the story. Mm. And so I turned it on. And from then point, that point on, I don't care who sees me. Like I I'd made a decision that for her, I wanted her to be able to see that they know that mommy's legally blind. It's, it's inevitable, you know, not inevitable, but you know, I wear these biotics, but that also mommy's okay with it because I want them to be able to learn that one, one's perfect but also that there is nothing more difficult in this human life than to not be able to be true to who you are. And this is a part of who I am. You're still mommy. And so <laughs> no matter what, right? Right. And and this is mommy with her magnifier. 
And so I want them with light. That's what she called it back then with light. <laughs> Love and with so light. I better. turned that light on, honey. I turned it on and then she leaned back and then I started reading her. And then guess what? Nobody cared. Right. <laughs> know, so it right? was just, it was just me who was like, oh my God, what are they going to think if they see? And I was so paranoid, but I just sat back and I was reading the story to her. From that point on, I made that conscious decision. I said, I'm going to tell people, I'm going to talk about it openly. I'm not going to try to hide this. You know, there are things that I struggle with. I want them to understand the struggles. I want them to know mommy gets anxiety in big crowds. She sees headless people. She sees a therapist, right? Because I want them to just see that, yes, you know, mommy does have these things, but she's doing the best that she can and that she's utilizing these resources in order to be able to be the best human being that she can be so that she can be the best mommy she can be because I want that to carry forward in them because they're going to have struggles, right? Yeah. And so I want them to be able to deal with it in a way that's healthy and a way that's open so that they don't try to hide their feelings and emotions and anything that may happen that may make them a little bit different like mommy. So that is one thing that has taught me you know, in this journey, this writing journey, and also of this finding myself in this journey. And it's been beautiful. And I just, my goal is to just be true to who I am, how I talk. I'm not hiding my accent that comes out sometimes. Everything is just, you know, authentic. And that is what I wanted to do in this space and then show my children the same thing so that they can be comfortable with who they are and be confident in that. That old adage, when one door closes, another one opens. Doesn't it? Oh my goodness. And usually the one that opens is better. Come on now. Because, (laughs) you know, I thought about it, you know, and like I would put on a certain voice, like my grandma's like, here she goes. Like, I, I felt like I needed to fit in. This is before the disability, because I felt like I had to talk a certain way or do things a certain way. And so now what you see is what you get. And I feel so much freer as a person, as a human. It's just a much happier space and place. And I'm doing something that I love. And the the little coins that I was making, they didn't matter. Because at the end of the day, they couldn't change anything anyway, right? right? There was nothing that could be done to change my vision. I was so focused on how much money I was making at one point that it, it didn't matter. And now I was working those 60 plus hours sometimes a week. And now I get to spend more time with my kids. I get to help them develop. And then I get to help them also not feel like this part of them because they do have an art part of them as well. They don't have to feel like, oh, it's just a hobby, you know, because that's something my grandmother would tell me like, well, you got to make this money. You know, that's just a yeah. hobby. Whereas like, no, you can have a balance. You can still write your story. My daughter wants to be a chef and a president of the United States. You can be a chef and you can be the president of the United (laughs) States. You know, it's possible. Anything is possible if you put your mind to it and just make sure you focus on, you know, what you can see and what you can do and not what you can't do and what you can't see, you know, and that's the perspective that I had to change even with my vision and in life is not focus on what I don't have not focus on what I can't see, but I can, you know, what I can see, what I can smell, you know, what I can, my senses have resurrected something that helps my writing, that I'm living this life, Debbie, that I never, ever imagined that I would be living. And it's been great. The journey had definitely some downs, but the beauty is that I did get up and that I I have inspired, at least a couple of people have told me, you inspired me to be able to to start this business or whatever. And I'm just getting started. My book just came out. And so I'm doing exactly what God told me to do. And I'm seeing the change. And that's what it's all about. Thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm so inspired. (laughs) Thank Thank you. you. Thank you for this show. I mean, you are doing amazing work. And so I thank you for allowing me to use your flat platform to be able to tell my story and all the other people that you're helping inspire and you're doing great work. So thank you. Thank you. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. 
please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.